Hello and welcome to Heat Illness Prevention for Field Workers and Pesticide Handlers. My name is Angelina Seha and I work with an organization called AgSafe. As a quick disclaimer, the content of this presentation is based on publicly available information. Such information is subject to change without notice, may be incomplete or condensed. Except where otherwise indicated, the information provided is based on matters as they exist at the time of the presentation. Such information is provided as general information on topics presented. Nothing presented today constitutes legal advice or opinion to participants or others attending or reviewing this material and is not a substitute for, for professional services. Every situation is different and subject to legislative activity and administrative or judicial changes in the law. You should also note that the views or opinions expressed by the presenters do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of AgSafe or the Almond Board of California. So we will start with our learning objectives. We are going to be reviewing a heat illness prevention standard elements as provided in section 3395, access to water, uh, review and updates, um, access to shade review, um, we will also be talking about weather monitoring and acclimatization, high heat procedures, employee and supervisor training elements, and then uh, also written procedures including emergency response. Heat illness prevention elements, Title Eight, Section 3395, applies to outdoor places of employment. This is one of the most cited sections by Cal OSHA for our industry in agriculture. Some of the training element requirements. Just as a reminder, an employer must ensure training for heat illness prevention and treatment under Title III of California Code of Regulations for both field worker and pesticide handlers annually. This is important as it is one of the major sections. Again, and just as a reminder, that um, Cal OSHA also cites this section as well, but as your yearly pesticide training, you also need to ensure that you are covering off on this information or whoever is training your employees is also covering off on heat illness information as well. So what are some of the major elements of heat illness prevention and things we need to ensure that we have? All employees need to have access to water. So we wanna make sure as employers that we are providing water, or if you're an employee, your employer must provide water at no cost. Again, here the recommendation is to ensure that we are looking at crew leaders, uh, supervisors, those that are supervising both our fill workers and our handlers, um, possibly those individuals that are possibly allowing for sale of food, sodas or bottled water, um, this can be interpreted as the employer selling them the water. So make sure that you're ensuring that if you are providing water, but there are other individuals that possibly are selling other goods, again, liquid goods in particular, um, where that could be interpreted by someone as the sell. So making sure that you as the employer, and employee, just as a reminder, your employer needs to provide you with access to water at no cost. It also must be fresh, pure, and suitably cool. So again, the recommendation here is to have a system of replenishment that includes adding ice, not only at the start of a shift, but throughout the workday. This is of particular importance when we're talking about our fill workers and our pesticide handlers. Um, sometimes our pesticide handlers are working at night um, or early morning hours, and it is encouraged that they continue to drink water, making sure um, the employer uh, is providing those provisions for the water and replenishment if the individual does run out. So if they start their work day with a container of water, how much water is in there? And we'll talk about water requirements here shortly. We also wanna ensure that the water is located as closely as uh, practicable to the areas where the employees are working. So again, if we have either a crew leader or supervisor, that they're checking where the water is placed and making sure that there are no obstructions for employees to access water. 
This includes having um, to go through any other obstructions um, that may be necessary to move water throughout the workday. So if you're talking about individual employees, this also applies, especially your handlers that sometimes aren't working in crews. Um, they might be working independently. You have to make sure that you are providing water for them. So again, that could be a portable water container or jug that they are taking with them. If you are a handler, um, then equally making sure that you have uh, water at the start of your workshop that it's made available by your employer. Um, additionally, recommendations from Cal OSHA for water um, purposes are to provide a jug of water in each row where the workers are working. And again, this is this can be practical for your fill workers, especially if they're working in crews. Um, additionally, um, they also recommend if this is practicable to have bottles uh, that the employees could carry and fill them as needed. Again, I think especially for your handlers uh, or for those individuals that are listening to this that are handlers, ensuring um, that you have water and again, it, it must be provided by your employer. Additionally, we must provide, and this is the employer must provide, excuse me, one quart of water per person per hour needs to be available at the start of the shift and again have some sort of water replenishment system in place. And we give a quick example here again talking about maybe a fill worker crew. Um, if you have a crew with 20 uh, employees, you should have at least five gallons of water available at all times and also have an established and documented system to replenish the water when it drops below the five gallons. Remember as well that if you sep uh, separate employees, right, smaller groups or have employees working by themselves in different areas that they have their own water available or that it, again, as close as practicable, even if the crew is nearby. Um, so this can include, again, an irrigator maybe going into a, a treated area, early entry workers, we have to ensure that any of the workers that are working even by themselves have accessibility to water. Um, you can provide if you're not already providing single use bottles or something of that effect, um, but you have water containers um, shared by, by employees that you also include single use drinking cups. Again, the recommendation for a handler and a um, and a fill worker is your employer also needs to provide you those. Additionally, um, if you are um, a supervisor or a grower, um, an individual that is responsible for employees, um, pesticide uh, handlers um, or fill workers, you wanna encourage the frequent, uh, frequent drinking of water. If you are one of those individuals, we remind you to make sure that you are drinking water and not waiting until you are thirsty. That is a sign that um, you are dehydrated. So making sure that even if you're working, especially if you're working at night possibly, um, oftentimes we might not be thirsty, but we need to drink water. Um, we also wanna make sure that we're not drinking heavily sugared drinks or heavily caffeinated drinks, which are very popular these days, um, as both of those uh, will dehydrate an individual versus provide them enough water um, for them to feel hydrated. Um, so in, ensuring that if you are drinking possibly or if your employees are drinking um, sugar drinks or uh, energy drinks um, that we avoid um, uh, the over the over drinking of those or at least the recommendation of not drinking too much. Access to shade. So this is another one and in particular when we're talking about pesticide uh, handlers and fill workers, um, typically it's a little bit easier when we're talking about fill workers, we will ensure that we make sure that we have available um, and this is the employer needs to ensure that there is available um, shade when the temperature exceeds 80 degrees Fahrenheit and provide timely access to shade upon uh, an employee's request regardless of temperature. So if, uh, if you're an employer ensuring that you have it even if the temperature doesn't um, 
get to 80 degrees that you still have that. Employees should be able to sit in a normal posture fully in the shade without having to be in a phys in physical contact with each other. There should be sufficient um, shade to accommodate all employees that take the break if they're taking the break at the same time. Again, this in particular, if you've got fill workers um, under the standard, you need to make sure that they are um, provided that shade. Um, also, it needs to be located as close as practicable to the areas where the employees are working. And again, we have to provide access to the shade, and this is the employer, must be permitted at all times. So if the employee wants access to shade, regardless of temperature, it needs to be made available. Shaded areas must not cause exposure. And what this means is they can't create an additional hazard, whether that's a safety hazard or a health hazard associated with that shade. Areas under mobile equipment, example tractors, irrigation equipment or pipes, or areas that require us to crouch, maybe a small tree, a bush of some sort, in order to sit fully in the shade are not acceptable. And we also can provide, especially when temperatures um, are at 95 degrees, requiring that an employee um, take a preventative cool down rest break. We want to ensure that the employee um, remain in the shaded area until the symptoms have abated, and we'll talk about symptoms here shortly. And this break can be no less than five minutes, not including the time needed to access that shade. So if it took five minutes to walk there, it can't be any less than five. It can be combined with, uh, if you have non-exempt employees, it can be combined with an already required for the state of California break. Um, of 10 minutes, um, but additionally, you have to ensure um, that you're providing those um, those those uh, cool down rest periods. Um, also, the employer needs to supervise that individual that has um, um, that is now taking that cool down rest period, which means that they need to be close enough by that if symptoms um, get worse. Um, then that they are providing the appropriate first aid, which is a requirement as well. So making sure that you also have a trained person uh, in first aid um, is important. Um, and training is available. Um, a lot of different organizations provide the, this training. Um, so make sure that you um, have an individual um, or if you are yourself an individual, maybe a handler or an employer, um, that you have an individual that's trained to ensure that they can provide that support. Another item that an employer supervisors are required to do is monitor our weather conditions. Um, so you need to ensure that you're tracking the weather of the job site and you can um, monitor what the predicted highs are for the day. There are a lot of um, applications and if obviously a physical t thermometer works uh, just as well uh, for the areas. Uh, are there anticipated heat waves? Um, is there an anticipated change in temperature? Is there going to be an increase in temperature? So you need to ensure so you can determine uh, and instruct your supervisors on how to um, modify their work schedules or um, um, or rest uh, and provide those increased water and rest breaks, or perhaps uh, complete the work early as necessary. So we'll talk about some of those preventative measures and recommendations as well. We also need to ensure that we have some high heat procedures. And again, in particular, probably more so with um, if there are any field worker employees, um, but also handler employees, um, making sure that you're specifying in a written program, so this is for the employer, um, what those procedures look like. Some of the um, 
recommendations, especially for this, is you have to ensure that you're that there's greater observance of those employees to look for some of the signs and symptoms of heat illness. So you can use a couple of things. Uh, it can be a supervisor that's observing at least no more than 20 people. You can also provide for a buddy system, right? So if you've got two handlers that are spraying at the same time, you can have them watch each other, right? And just ensure that they're okay. And we do this for other things. So you can definitely um, do that as well. Others, regular communication. So are you communicating with the person? Maybe if it's a, uh, an individual employee that's working by themselves, are you communicating by radio or cell phone? And then really any other means of observation that you deem um, are appropriate, again, if you're the employer um, that you ensure you have. So high heat procedures, um, again, um, making sure that you have designated one or more employees at the work site that can call for services or for support and allowing other employees to call services when no designated employee is available. Um, so what oftentimes happens is especially again, high heat procedures are triggered at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so anything over 95 degrees, um, an employer is supposed to institute high heat procedures. Um, what can often ha times happen is a, a field worker or a handler might not feel um, comfortable enough to call, or maybe they've been informed that they should always call that supervisor or the owner or the grower. Um, and, um, and now um, they have an event and again, associated with heat um, and um, they need to call for help. And unfortunately, they're not authorized. So this is um, the, the change that was made um, a few years back about ensuring that um, individuals, you can have a designated person that calls for, for, for help emergency services, but you also have to um, provide employees with information regarding um, their right to call um, if that designated person is not available. Um, so making sure, again, the reminders during a, a tailgate meeting or pre-shift meeting to uh, follow the company's procedures, especially on those days when we know it's going to get um, over 95 um, to drink water and to take their breaks, that they have a right um, to take those cool down breaks when necessary. Again, um, when we're talking about high heat procedures, and I mentioned this previously, um, you, they can be taken in conjunction with the already for non-exempt employees um, um, required um, rest breaks at 10 minutes um, every two hours. Um, and again, this is when those temperatures exceed 95 degrees. The 10 minute break is always um, available to employees if they're working a certain determined period of time um, during the workday. So um, recovery periods may be taken uh, concurrently with or without break required breaks. Um, it shall not result in any additional breaks or other than when it is required by the wage order in which the employee is working. Uh, if the work day extends beyond eight hours, they'll take another break um, at the conclusion of the eight hour. Uh, if the work day extends beyond 10 hours, um, the employee will take a break at the conclusion of the 10th hour. So um, making sure that um, you understand that um, as an employee, if you're a, a field worker or a handler, or as an employer um, that we need to be providing these, um, um, these uh, rest periods already as part of the law. It, it doesn't mean an additional rest period necessarily uh, for those cool down periods, but you need to be providing them with the cool down periods. Emergency response procedures. Unfortunately, sometimes we do have to call for support um, so ensure effective communication. Um, if you are the person responsible, uh, a supervisor, a grower, et cetera, make sure that you respond to the signs and symptoms of heat illness um, as soon as possible. Take immediate action. If indicators of serious uh, heat illness um, 
then ensure, right, if the person isn't getting better, we need to ensure that we have an emergency response procedure in place. Also ensure that employees exhibiting or reporting signs of heat illness are monitored and not left by themselves. We mentioned that previously. On-site first aid or appropriate medical emergency medical services are also offered to that employee and then contact that emergency medical services and ensure that clear and precise directions to the site are provided. Uh, oftentimes we're working in remote areas and so that emergency response regardless of whether it's a heat event or it could be pesticide related event and we'll talk about some of that as well, um, ensuring that if the person cannot um, be taken right by the employer to a facility uh, for treatment um, and we, we do need to call emergency services that we know um, that we have a map or location, address, um, signage, et cetera, that can get the person, uh, that can get the emergency services there to treat the individual. So acclimatization. As an employer, you are responsible for the working conditions of your employees. You must act efficiently when conditions result in sudden exposure to heat that your employees are not used to. So again, if um, there's a heat wave, um, if the employee is just not used to working, maybe you're coming back from um, to start your season and the person hasn't been working outdoors, um, then we want to make sure that we're allowing enough time for the person to get used to both the weather and also the activities that the individual will be doing um, as they work outdoors now. Um, so all employees need to be closely observed by a supervisor or designee during heat waves. So is when there's a sudden change in temperature and it increases. Um, employees newly assigned to heat areas, again, maybe they haven't been working um, outdoors for a while. Those four, first 14 days of employment, and it's really 14, um, they used to say two weeks, and now we're really can't count off 14 days um, that they're working, um, they need to be observed. Um, and, and perhaps, again, something needs to be adjusted. So during this time, you need to ensure that you're extra vigilant with those employees. And you as an employee, if you yourself are an employee listening to this, um, you need to ensure that you're recognizing those symptoms and a possible illness and then notifying um, your supervisor. Um, lessen, right? So this, again, is more the control that a supervisor has to lessen the intensity and or uh, shift the length of the newly hired uh, employees working uh, work during a two or more week break and period. Um, so making sure that if we can modify work schedules or reschedule some of those duties uh, during those hot summer months, um, that that is done as well. So employee training. Um, so again, a, a key component of this is we need to talk a little bit about with employees, especially again, and this includes both handlers and, um, and field workers, um, when we're talking about pesticides, we need to include um, environmental and personal risk factors. What is the employer procedures for compliance? The importance of drinking water, and we've talked about how water needs to be free of charge and cool, et cetera, and the distance. Uh, the importance of uh, acclimatization, the type of heat illness and signs and symptoms related to it, um, the ability to be able to immediately report those symptoms, what is going to be the employer response plan for possible heat illness, and then any emergency response procedures, including medical services, um, have a clear and precise inst have clear and precise instructions for medical services, and we've talked about that um, with a designated um, personnel. So, what are some of the environmental health and um, heat illness risk factors um, that we need to ensure that we are looking at? So, one first and foremost, these environmental uh, risk factors are temperature. So, what is the ambient temperature? Two. Is there any humidity um, associated with that? And depending on your location, uh, you might be looking at 
what is the humidity um, associated in those areas. Um, we have different weather events in, um, in the state of California that sometimes, again, humidity in certain areas can be a little bit higher. Uh, we also need to take that into consideration when we're talking about heat illness risk. Uh, what is the air movement? Um, you know, is the air stagnant? Um, do we have a little wind? Um, is, it a, is it a delta breeze? Is it a coastal breeze? Um, also the radiant heat. Um, is the person going to be exposed to, uh, to the sun? Right? So we now have the additional, not only the temperature, but um, again, that outdoor setting that can be associated with uh, increased um, environmental factor. And then we've got our personal uh, heat illness uh, risk factors. So a person's age, individuals that are maybe are over a certain age, um, typically we, we think about 65 and over. Um, what is the fi physical fitness level of the individual as well? Um, can be associated with it. Is the person used to the heat? Uh, maybe they just, again, came back um, for the season and they're starting and it's 95 degrees and there's humidity, um, the person might not be used to it, even if the person has done the work previously. Are there any medical conditions that I might need to consider um, or medications? Both of these are protected under our HIPAA laws. Um, so as an employer, can't necessarily ask, but definitely can mention um, to the employee to talk to their medical provider. Um, to ensure that the type of work that they're doing and any medical conditions or medications that they're taking are um, acceptable for the type of work that they're doing. So they can have that conversation with their physician or doctor. Obviously refraining from alcohol or drug use, in particular if they're doing um, any sort of work, um, uh, making sure you have a policy in place uh, that speaks to that, and then avoiding the use of caffeine. Again, we talked about sugary drinks and um, energy drinks as well. Um, that can also, again, affect an individual um, uh, wh when they're working outdoors in the heat. So we're talking about some of the heat illness signs and symptoms, uh, recognizing um, that heat exhaustion, um, we consider uh, less severe than heat stroke, and, but both might require medical help. So a couple of the signs and symptoms for heat exhaustion include um, heavy sweating, cramps, rapid pulse, uh, perhaps a headache, nausea or vomiting. A person who's suffering from heat stroke, we're looking at dry, red, hot skin, fainting, um, high body temperature, or the person has stopped sweating, um, disorientation and confusion, possibly the person has uh, lost consciousness, etc. So again, already talked a little bit about the heat stress uh, symptoms. What should we do? Move the person to a cool shaded area to rest. If you are the individual suffering from heat stress, then find someone, a supervisor, another person or individual that can help you. Um, you also wanna, if the individual is able to, loosen any and remove any heavy clothing that they might be wearing. Uh, oftentimes, um, especially, or personal protective equipment, if we're talking about um, any Tyvek suits or coveralls a person might be using, example for a handler. Uh, have the person drink cool water. If they're not feeling um, too sick from their stomach, so if they're having any sort of stomach issues, you don't, you really kind of want to avoid giving them, um, giving them a drink or, or food. Um, try to cool the person by fanning them um, or finding a cool space where you can uh, where the person is able to uh, cool down. Um, you can also um, use some, some mist or water or wet cloth. Uh, if the person doesn't feel better in a few minutes, then you want to call for help. Um, if the heat exhaustion is not treated, the heat illness may advance to heat stroke. So we said that there's one that was a little less severe. They're both um, need, to, you need to exercise extreme caution with heat illness. You really do need to call for emergency help. 
right? So we talked about some of those if the person's already fainted or collapsed or perhaps is experiencing mood mood swings, their skin is um, is is hot to the touch. Um, or they have high temperature, you're calling for help, emergency helps, so you're calling, you're activating your emergency medical services or your emergency action plan uh, in your workplace, you're moving the person to a cool shaded area, you're removing again all of that heavy uh, and outer clothing as best as possible, um, have the person drink some water again if they're able to, if they're not, or their stomach doesn't feel well, you know, don't uh, force them to drink anything. You want to cool them down. You want to try to uh, find some ice or, you know, something cool. Place some ice packs under their armpits, groin area, and then um, recognize that you need to be alert um, when EMS arrives. So some other major heat illnesses um, that can be associated. Again, um, we're talking about um, heat stress, and we talked about some of the, the more extreme, but if we kind of go down the list, uh, we have heat rash, we also have heat cramps, we talked about heat exhaustion, we talked about heat stroke, and then there's also another um, where we have uh, muscle breakdown, um, and so you have to also ensure that, um, again, uh, making sure that you're paying attention to that. So with heat rash, we've got a cause and prevention. So the cause, um, irritation of skin due to excess sweating. Um, also, if we have environments where we have a lot of humidity, um, we can also see some uh, causes of heat stress. So what can we do to prevent it? You wanna make sure that you're wearing some loose fitting clothing that allows for sweat to dissipate. Uh, you wear freshly laundered uh, clothing each day. Um, and again, as part of uh, field worker and handler training, we talk about this, it's changing out. It's um, every day that you get home from work, you're showering, um, you're bathing, and then you're putting on clean clothes. Um, so again, if we wanna try to avoid some heat, heat, heat rash, we're doing the same thing. Avoid wo working in, a, uh, in sweat uh, soaked clothing for prolonged periods of time. Um, again, if you're wearing a coveralls or a, a Tyvek suit, especially as part of your personal protective equipment, or for employees that are doing, wearing that as handlers, um, they're going to, to sweat a lot. So this is one that we need to um, pay attention to that perhaps they are changing out um, depending on how long they might be working. We have those change areas that we are encouraging our employees to go and change if they are perhaps um, wearing those suits in, in, in warmer weather. Um, you're washing uh, your sweat soaked areas with mild soap and water and drying thoroughly at breaks and after your, end, your shift ends, right? So again, making sure you have a process if you are an employer or vice versa, if you are a pesticide handler wearing personal protective equipment, this could be something that unfortunately during um, our, our warmer months, uh, we need to make sure that we're paying attention to and ensuring um, that we're doing everything we can to prevent it. Heat cramps. Um, are typically caused by depleted salts due to excess sweat. So again, we're wearing the personal protective equipment or perhaps respirators as well. So this is a continuum of, of not just the personal protective equipment in terms of you know, our gloves and our, our suits or our coveralls, um, but also perhaps um, our respirators for those of you wearing respirators. Uh, so what can we do here for prevention? Uh, acclimatization to heat helps reduce salt and water loss and making sure that we are drinking adequate amounts of water throughout the day. Um, and then you not necessarily need to um, eat more salt, but if you do, um, just making sure you're, you know, their salts and food are, are to taste. So again, um, the muscle uh, exertion or the cause and prevention, so combined heat stress and prolonged muscle exertion can cause issues. So same as for heat exhaustion and heat stroke, and we talked about these previously. Avoid overexertion, such as lifting objects heavier than you can comfortably lift or strain, straining muscles to a point where they can no longer function properly. 
those with other medical conditions, including uh, diabetes, uh, perhaps thyroid condition or muscular dystrophy are at a greater risk. Um, those with a viral infection, flu, HIV, or herpes are also at a greater risk. Use of alcohol and illegal drugs such as heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamines can increase the risk as well. Some medications such as antipsychotics or statins can increase the risk for this as well. I've mentioned a few um, components when we're talking about uh, signs and symptoms and how to treat and how to prevent that have to do with pesticide handlers and additional risks um, are also uh, mentioned here. So we're gonna talk a little bit about those. And um, if they are wearing or if they are using certain pesticides, you might be required, you as the handler or an applicator, or perhaps if you're an employer, uh, your employees doing handling activities or application activities um, to do a medical evaluation and clearance. You need to take into consideration how uh, their perhaps their medical situation might be affected by heat um, associated events. Um, we talked about some of those environmental concerns and those health concerns as well. Um, if we're doing fit testing um, and the person is going to be wearing a respirator, um, are there increased concerns in terms of cardiac um, issues? Remember, with heat events um, and, and heat illness, we're talking about uh, body not being able to um, cool down quickly enough. So is that putting strain on something else, especially if the person's wearing a respirator? Um, making sure that we're reviewing what the label says is required personal protective equipment and that we're providing uh, the proper um, protection for our employees. Are there methods or ways of uh, um, a training in terms of, um, are there other things we can do as, for example, a closed cap with air conditioning versus an open cap that maybe does it. So are there things we can do? And then again, uh, additional personal protective equipment, and I've mentioned this before, um, coveralls or Tyvek suits, the one-time use suits, or the chemical resistant suits, those additionally, um, again, put strain both on the body um, and potentially on that person to not be able to regulate um, cooling down. Um, so more observation needs to be done of that individual, or perhaps we associate how we ensure um, that we maybe switch out times that we're doing certain applications um, so, that, so that if they are required to wear those pieces of equipment, personal protective equipment, excuse me, that they are able to um, take some breaks, um, or perhaps we schedule them for another day when it's not going to be so hot. So again, the medical ev evaluation may, may restrict use due to health concerns. Uh, we also might have PPE alone. Uh, it can be a heat illness concern, again, due to the respirator and protective suits. Additionally, medical restrictions can elevate heat illness concerns if the person has other underlying conditions, if they're mentioning it in those uh, medical evaluations, which again, we don't have access to, but if the employee needs to then ensure that they're talking to their medical provider and letting the medical provider know the type of work that the individual is doing. Um, additionally, the same applies for medications. Um, they, can, uh, they can talk to their physician or doctor and ensure that that individual is giving them the information necessary, um, knowing the type of work that they're doing and the effects that the medication or those medical conditions may have on their bodies. Um, so higher risk for handlers and applicators, especially when we're talking about heat illness. Um, both the handlers and applicators have a higher risk because they are wearing typically personal protective equipment, whether that be uh, respirators or suits, um, again, a chemical resistant suits um, or Tyvek suits or coveralls, again, that are protecting their skin, however, um, are not allowing for the for the body to cool down. If they're taking certain medication, if they have had a heat-induced illness in the past, their bodies can be more susceptible to heat illness. And again, while as an employer, I do not have the ability to ask employees about um, 
their medications or medical conditions if you have been made aware the employee has shared with you or it has happened in their workplace in your workplace previously then definitely more attention needs to be paid to um, that employee to ensure that they are okay all PPE must be worn according to the label or the employer's um, requirements however if heat is too much um, for that individual and you want to change the application that might be a good time to change the application time um, so again, um, we see this a lot in terms of adjusted scheduling. It could be late at night, early in the morning, um, when we are just waiting basically for the sun to go down or before the sun comes up. Uh, and that way, if the employee is wearing personal protective equipment, it won't be as warm or as hot. Mixers and loaders often are wearing similar PPE, um, as, uh, as, as mentioned, to applicators and have the same need to plan tasks around the cooler parts of the day. Again, that early morning, maybe evening or night at nighttime. Additionally, a decontamination facility should be available. At the beginning of each workday, sufficient water, soap, and single-use towels. Um, Sanitizing gels and liquids or other towelettes are not considered substitutes for soap or single use towels. For routine washing of hands and face and for emergency eye flush and for handlers sufficient to wash the entire body. At least three gallons of water per handler, at least one gallon of water per field worker. One clean change of coveralls is of it needs to be available for handlers at each decontamination site. Additionally, we want to ensure that we're protecting handlers and applicators. So you want to ensure if you're the employer that you're setting up the work to do the heaviest work in the coolest part of the day, if at all possible. And this can include uh, adjusting work schedules, perhaps starting early in the morning. And we've talked about this previously. Uh, slowly building up the tolerance to the heat and to the work activity, especially if we have a lot of physical exertion from the employee. We want to ensure that we are building up the tolerance of that heat. Remember, it's 14 days um, that we are observing the employee to ensure that they um, are um, able to withstand and handle that heat, especially if they have not been working in outdoor environments. And additionally, we have to ensure that we are talking about um, the type of work that they are doing. Um, additionally, we want to ensure that they are drinking plenty of cool water, encouraging the drinking of water, um, should be done every 15 to 20 minutes, at least eight ounces is the recommendation. Wear lightweight, breathable clothing if personal protective um, equipment is not required. If personal protective equipment is required, ensure that you're following label instructions for that use and that you're using the appropriate PPE mentioned in the label or if your employer has additional requirements. Take frequent short breaks in cool shaded areas. Avoid areas that create an additional hazard. When we're talking about handlers and applicators, oftentimes, They'll want to take their breaks in areas that are cool and shaded. After they've applied the pesticides, oftentimes they'll go back into the area they just treated. Um, that is not an acceptable place to take breaks, so make sure that, that you're finding um, a, a other locations. If you are the handler, speak to your supervisor about the appropriate place to take them. If you are an employer or a supervisor, ensure you're um, explaining to your handlers to not go in to areas they just treated um, to take their breaks. Avoid eating large meals if possible before working in hot environments as your body cannot metabolize or has to use a lot of energy to uh, metabolize the food you just ate. Um, and can also create an additional hazard. Additionally, avoid, um, we've mentioned this previously, any caffeinated drinks, uh, sh heavily sugary drinks, or energy drinks, um, and alcoholic beverages before working in the heat. Most companies have um, drug and alcohol policies. Um, 
that um, speak to alcohol and other uh, drug um, um, drug substances or illegal substances that cannot be used in the workplace. Make sure you are familiar with those. You also want to ensure that you remember the signs and symptoms of heat stress and how to treat it. If you are an employee, uh, handler, applicator, making sure that you are informing a supervisor when you are not feeling well or your grower when you're not feeling well. If you are the actual handler, applicator, um, excuse me, if you are the employer, making sure you're paying attention to the handler and applicator um, to, um, for any signs and symptoms. Some of the symptoms, and I have here a list, it is not an all-inclusive uh, list, um, but um, gives you an idea that sometimes heat illness symptoms can look like um, pesticide poisoning. So we have to ensure that we are careful um, when we are um, thinking about which it could be, that it could be one or it could be the other regardless that we are getting uh, medical attention. So some of the uh, symptoms could be sweating, headache, fatigue, nausea, central nervous um, system depression, loss of coordination, confusion, fainting, fainting obviously a little uh, different. Um, if it's poisoning, it could look a little different, but a lot of these can be similar symptoms. Um, if you are an applicator, a handler, or a fill worker, and you start feeling sick, inform uh, the appropriate individual in your work site, uh, let someone know, your supervisor, your grower, that you're not feeling well so that they can provide you with treatment, whether that be for a pesticide related event or for a heat illness event if, um, if it's warm out or hot out. With employee training, employers are required to additionally address a couple of other items that we haven't necessarily mentioned, one of which is that you need to ensure if you are the employer that you are talking about an employee's right to exercise his rights under the heat illness prevention standard without fear of retaliation, which includes that they have access and impeded access or let's say um, quick access to water, shade, and that they are allowed to rest and we have those cool down recovery periods and that they can exercise their rights um, to not work in a location that perhaps doesn't have water or doesn't provide for shade um, and that they do not fear retaliation by letting an employer know about um, those conditions and that the employer will act promptly to correct um, the hazard associated with that. Also, uh, procedures for acclimatization, someone is monitoring weather, um, someone is ensuring, and this is usually a supervisor, um, is ensuring um, that the employee is able to work, um, um, maybe adjusting work schedules, changing um, the times that they're doing certain work, um, and or perhaps shortening the work day, um, to ensure that the employee is um, acclimatized to the weather during that time. Also making sure that we have appropriate first aid and emergency response to heat illness. Additionally, under the heat uh, illness prevention standard, we also um, are required, or employers, excuse me, are required to have supervisor training. It needs to be provided to address uh, the information required um, to be presented to the employee, so that same information also needs to ensure that there are procedures for when they are implementing the heat illness prevention plan provisions, uh, the procedures to follow when an employee is maybe not feeling well, again, exhibiting any of those symptoms previously discussed, uh, of possible heat illness, including emergency response procedures, how to monitor weather uh, reports, and how to respond to hot weather advisories. Every company should have written procedures, now called the Heat Illness Prevention Plan. This plan needs to be both uh, needs to be in writing in both English and um, the language understood by the majority of the employees. 
it must be made available at each work site. And this means physically available. It cannot be in a locked um, vehicle um, or in an office that is not in proximity to where the employee is working. Um, so say a 30 minute drive, um, that would not be acceptable. It also needs to be um, available if a representative from Cal OSHA visits, um, they require that you have um, your um, uh, written procedures available for them to review uh, at the work site where you have workers working. So again, this is a reminder for employers or growers. Additional at minimum, these written procedures need to include procedures for providing water and access to shade. And we've talked about the water provisions, water at no cost, uh, one quart of water per person per hour. Um, we also talked a little bit about how much water employees should be drinking, how close to them the water needs to be, access to shade. Um, so shade should be accessible at minimal at 80 degrees, but at any time the employee requests, we should have shade, make shade available. Uh, high heat procedures are triggered at 95 degrees. And so if you're in locations where you know the temperature will increase to be um, at least 95 or more, um, you need to have high heat procedures and your employees need to know what those procedures are as well as your supervisors. Um, procedures for a close supervision of those employees if something happens, which includes a, a heat wave and heat waves are described as any day when the predicted temperature will be at least 80 degrees Fahrenheit and at least 10 degrees higher than the average daily temperature in the preceding five days. For the first 14 days, as mentioned previously, an employee is working in newly assigned high heat areas, then we need to provide for close supervision. Again, if adjustments and work schedules can be made, those are acceptable as well. Uh, however, we do need to ensure that they are being supervised. The rent procedures also include, and as mentioned previously, we talked about emergency response procedures. And that means effective um, communication so that an employee may contact uh, supervisor when necessary. Effective means, and these are just examples, uh, can be voice, observation, um, making sure that we have electronic means. This can include cell phone or text, perhaps if we have a lone employee. Um, these may only be used if reception in the area is reliable. If you don't have a good connection or it's spotty reception, these are not acceptable means uh, for communicating. Uh, again, um, whether it be with a crew or whether it be with uh, an individual or individuals working by themselves, uh, making sure that we have reliable means. This could be a two-way radio. Maybe that is a better, better reception than uh, other electronic means, or perhaps they do need to be supervised by someone who is on site and available if something were to transpire. Additional written procedures include protocol for responding to signs and symptoms of heat illness and must include, but are not limited to first aid measures. Um, so again, providing the first aid if the employee isn't feeling well, um, having, um, um, knowing what to do, putting them in a cool shaded area, uh, allowing for airflow in the location where they're at or cool down. Um, also how to contact emergency medical services and um, who is the designated person if the designated person isn't there, um, then ensuring that we have a process. If we are unable to reach emergency medical services, um, then how are we transporting the employee? Where the emergency medical services can perhaps um, meet us or um, reach us? How to provide clear and precise directions to the work site and during um, and ensuring that takes place? I would suggest drills or some sort of process where you are talking 
um, we are providing that and in, that information ahead of time and then perhaps practicing some role play around if you're the employer around how they're getting the to the site designating the individual to contact emergency medical services and ensuring the emergency protocols are put into action. So what are those emergency, what is your emergency medical service and your emergency action plan look like? Those should be included as well. Observation and response requirements. So again, as part of your um, written program, and again, all companies uh, are required to have a written heat illness prevention program if you are um, doing outdoor work. Um, we recently have um, instituted the indoor work that also will require a plan. Um, so pretty much all employers will now be covered under either the indoor or the outdoor plans. Uh, we need to ensure that we're requiring supervisors to take immediate action if an employee exhibits signs or symptoms of heat illness. You want to ensure um, that you as the employer or your supervisors aren't sending an employee that says that they are not feeling well and are exhibiting signs and symptoms of heat illness without first offering on-site um, first aid. Right again, so the basic first aid, and we talked about what some of that looked like, or providing emergency medical services. Um, so what oftentimes happens is perhaps an employee doesn't feel well, and instead of providing them support, and the person says, I don't feel good, I just wanna go home, um, we do encourage you to ask some questions, you the employer or employer representative or supervisor of that employee to ensure that you're providing, if you are the first aid provider on your work site, providing um, or offering first aid um, prior to um, having them go home. So asking um, some questions around um, some of the symptoms um, to ensure. Um, that they're perhaps not suffering from a heat illness or even pesticide poisoning and, um, and that you're having those conversations with them um, to ensure that they don't go home and then you get a call that they're at the hospital or worse um, and it could have been prevented. Uh, so just as a review, we want to ensure we talked about quite a few things. Um, but we talked about access to water and some updates. Um, we mentioned that water needs to be free of charge. We need to have at least one quart of water and needs to be as close as practicable to the work site and unimpeded access. We also discussed what to do with the lone workers, especially um, handlers possibly, or those individuals doing early entry, such as an irrigator that perhaps needs to go into an area, making sure that they also have access to water, whether those um, be personalized containers that they carry with them, um, but that they be as close as practical and not forgetting that they also, we also need to ensure that those individuals not only are field worker crews, but also our handlers, our loan workers also have access to uh, water, that it's close by, um, it's free of charge. Um, access to shade, um, so ensuring that they have access to shade that is not going to create an additional hazard, um, that shade needs to be available regardless of temperature. So at 80 degrees, we must have shade. However, the employee can ask for shade and shade should be provided. Um, Additionally, weather monitoring and acclimatization, and we talked about this, a supervisor or someone responsible for employees uh, should be monitoring the weather, looking to ensure that there aren't any uh, heat waves, or if there are, that we are preparing for those. Um, additionally, ensuring that employees are provided with um, the time necessary to acclimatize to the changes in weather, um, especially if they're new employees, um, but also when we have heat waves, we are supposed to ensure that the employees are also being provided with um, uh, 
with the time necessary where they're going to be observed more closely, um, perhaps change in schedules to ensure that that employee um, is provided um, the time necessary for their body to get used to the heat. That if temperatures are 95 degrees and over, that high heat procedures apply, um, which include uh, close observation of our employees and um, other methods of communication. Also, in, needs to include be included in your written program. We talked extensively about some of the employee and supervisory training elements, which include signs and symptoms for uh, the major heat illness um, events, uh, including heat exhaustion and heat stress, and what to do. Also, the additional training elements that supervisors must cover off on and supervisors must know, which include emergency procedures, um, our written procedures, our emergency response and what to do and where to go, all of those things um, that we discussed previously. We do have some additional resources available. AgSafe provides some um, uh, some videos, uh, Cal OSHA website, especially when we're talking about heat illness, has extensive resources and information and training um, tools that you can use. And the federal OSHA site as well has information around heat um, that may be of use um, in terms of that. I want to thank you for your time. If you need to reach us, our website is www dot agsafe.org. Our phone number is 209-526-4400. Thank you and have a great day.